Good afternoon to our CLA family members, clients, community partners, and friends. Welcome back to our live stream. We sincerely hope that all of you are staying safe and healthy at this time. Today, we have several important topics to cover. We are going to start our discussion today with Dustin Hubbard, who will cover important state and local tax implications related to COVID and the taxation of PPP and other Consolidated Appropriations Act matters. He's also going to talk about the tax implications that can sneak up on us related to remote workforces. So welcome, Dustin. We also have Jack Rybicki, who's going to cover PPP from the borrower side, and Todd Spring to jump in and cover PPP updates from the lender lens. So welcome, everybody. Before we dive in today, we have some housekeeping that we want to cover. We do have the ability for live Q&A during our session today. In order to participate, you must register and log in using the link below me. The questions were, will appear for you to like and to move up in priority so that we can address them. We have moderators who are standing by and they are ready to engage and interact with you. We also did want to inform you of a couple special upcoming events. Tomorrow we have a webinar scheduled on January 29th for lenders on PPP originations and forgiveness forms, so be sure to check that out. Additionally, on February 10th, we have an event that will focus on the 2021 market and tax outlook. So you can register for both of these events on our website. And finally, in addition to these great events, be on the lookout for articles, white papers providing additional guidance, and contact your CLA representative because we absolutely want to talk to you and engage with you. So with that background, Let's start today with Dustin. Dustin, it is fantastic having you. I know you've had a busy day. You guys have already had a session today discussing some of these topics, so we're thrilled to have you. But pressure is definitely mounting with state legislatures and revenue agencies before 2020 filing season really gets hot and heavy here to clarify how to treat benefits that have been added to the tax code related to the COVID relief laws. So we've had the CARES Act, we've had the Consolidated Appropriations Act. A huge piece of that was PPP and the related forgiveness. And frankly, a lot of people are just confused, well, what do I do with this from a state and local tax perspective? And it can be deceptive and sneaky. So we would love you to give an overview just of what you're seeing with that. For sure. And thanks, Leslie, for uh, inviting me to join you today. Um, happy to talk about this. It's something that I'm passionate about. And you're right. Um, states are feeling the pressure. They're under the gun to get something done. Uh, because when you look at state conformity to the Internal Revenue Code, what you find is that they typically do it three different ways. And the first way you see that is rolling conformity. And rolling conformity just simply means I'm automatically adopting everything that changes in the Internal Revenue Code as it comes out. I don't have to do anything as long as I want to adopt that. That covers off about 20 of the states across the country. The second method is a static conformity. And in those states, they pick a date. So like the state of California is updated through 1-1-2015. And other states out there have picked March 27th, 2020. Surprise, surprise. Um, the last way that states do that is selective conformity. And they don't adopt the entire Internal Revenue Code. They pick and choose pieces of the code that they want to adopt. And so what we're seeing right now from the states, because they have to balance their budgets, unlike the federal government, they have to be balanced. And so they're going through rolling conformity states are going through and looking at it and saying, what's the budget hit I'm going to take because I've automatically adopted all of these provisions. And based on what they determine in that, they're going to issue either decoupling language or they're going to leave it alone and figure out ways to fill the budget gap um, a different method. Static conformity states are looking at, do I update just pick a date like 1121 or do we leave it at 112015 for California for example and then do what they've done which is they they originally over the summer last year proposed and passed legislation to adopt the forgiveness of the loan um, and treat that as non-taxable but in that legislation they clearly put in the statute we're not going to allow you to deduct the expenses 
So now they've got proposed legislation to allow for the deductibility of the expenses. Um, another state, Arizona, has proposed, again, legislation to just update as of 1-1-21. So it's kind of all over the place at this point in time. From a forgiveness standpoint, you're going to find the rolling conformity states automatically allowing that to be non-taxable. Static, you're going to have to wait and see kind of what they do. And as of right now, you're going to have to, if you're going to file returns in states before they do something with this provision, you're going to have to file it based on what the law says, which is it's taxable income. Same thing with the deductibility of expenses. Again, what you're going to see is those um, states that adopted the March 27th date, they're going to allow you to forgive that loan and not tax that loan, but those expenses currently are going to be disallowed. And so you're going to have to look at it on a state-by-state -state basis and see what's going on there. Well, that is a lot to keep up with. 50 states sure makes it complicated. And I know that can be frustrating to you just because states are slow to legislate and certainly they're evaluating how to balance their budgets. So I think that does bring up another complicated area mm -hmm. and we should discuss, and that is apportionment and how we factor that into the PPP. Frankly, until you put out a chart for the firm, it was something I didn't even contemplate. So can you discuss what apportionment is and then what are some of the unique nuances that we may have to consider when we think about PPP in those apportionment formulas? Yeah, and, and so quickly or high level from an apportionment standpoint, what it is is it's a formula that the states developed back in the 50s using property in the state, payroll in the state, sales in the state, coming up with percentages of those in each state, adding that together in some sort of weighting between those three factors and saying, here's the percent of income, federal taxable income that this state's allowed to tax. And they did that because in the 50s, they were getting sued a lot around that um, because they were all trying to tax 100% of it. So they developed this formula to try and keep the federal legislation out of it and, and let them kind of govern themselves. But that's, that's where they're at. And, and when it comes down to it, um, on the PPP stuff, the loan, the deductions, the question is, if these deductions are disallowed, should they be included in my apportionment factor? Should I get representation for them? And, and the reality is probably not. There's no guidance directly on that, but that's that's the question that's out there. And if I do get representation from them, which numerator of that apportionment, which state numerator should those go in? From a sales standpoint, it's a little bit cleaner when you look at it, if I'm including that loan in taxable income, should that be represented in my factor? And, and ultimately what we come down to is three different answers that you could potentially come up with. And even within those three, there's some additional options. But the first one is, yes, I should get factor representation from it because it's included in my tax base. And so the answer to that would then be, okay, so then once I do that, how do I source it? And there, again, without having specific guidance on PPP, we have to look at what the historical treatment has been. And, and that's typically going to come down to how states are going to treat similar income, interest income, dividend income, intangible income. If they include that in their apportionment factor, which again is only about half the states, a lot of states are going to source that to commercial domicile. And so that gets picked up in the numerator of your home state for business operations. There's another couple positions out there that, that you could think about taking. And the first one is in a lot of states, there's a provision in their apportionment factor that says if it's an occasional sale of a substantial amount, then it shouldn't be included in the factor. So in that state or in that circumstance where you have a state with that provision, you can just kick it out and not include it. And you probably have some authority to do that. And the final one would be to say, hey, it's distortive. It should be kicked out. And again, that's a state by state analysis, but something that we should definitely be looking at and thinking about because the sourcing is always a question, et cetera. Yeah, so this is definitely a year, I think what you've highlighted, to really start those conversations early with your tax advisor mm -hmm. and understand how they can have an impact. So let's talk about another really hot topic right now. I've had these issues come up as people are filing 1099s and filing W-2s, but we've got a remote workforce that a lot of people now think is here to stay to some degree, and it's going to create challenges from state and local tax perspectives, from global tax perspectives. And I know you 
the global team and the HR team all came together and did a holistic article on remote workforce and just the challenges and the traps that that can create. So talk to me a little bit about what are some of those issues from a state tax perspective that can crop up related to worker mobility? Yeah, and I think I think the main there's main two two main issues that we should talk about. And the first one is going to be wage withholding. And and in most states, what you would see from a wage withholding standpoint under normal circumstances is that wage withholding on on my income as an individual providing services in a state, that withholding should happen in the state where I'm physically located when I'm performing those services. And so where I typically had employees all coming to a work office and working in one location, that's where I withheld. Well, now as employees are moving out, um, you look at cities that are on state lines like Minneapolis, like Kansas City, Chicago, even for that matter. Um, and then the Northeast is just a whole fun mess. Um, what, what you're finding is you've got employees now physically working in states that they don't normally work in. And how should those rules apply? So that's the first thing. The second thing that comes up is nexus. So now if I've got that employee working permanently in a different state or, or temporarily in a different state, is that going to create nexus for me as a company for income tax purposes, for sales tax purposes, for any other tax that may apply? Because now I have some employee in the state working remotely from their vacation home, working from you know mom and dad's for a month, whatever the case may be. So those are the two things that we got to think through. And about 15 or 20 states actually provided some sort of guidance. Their guidance wasn't consistent. Their guidance, um, some of them talked about withholding, some of them talked about nexus, some of them talked about both of them. Um, but the other thing that's key about those 15 or 20 states is that they're the smaller states. Big states like California, New York, Texas, Illinois, they didn't issue a lot of guidance with regards to this. But they issued guidance around COVID and said, you know, due to COVID, people working remotely, you're not going to withhold. Um, or it's not going to create nexus for the company. So those are things that they threw out there. But again, how they did that was not consistent across the board. And then the other thing is you had some jurisdictions that said, we don't really care about COVID. If the employee used to work here, you still need to work withhold on them here. And that has led to lawsuits. There's a current lawsuit between the state of Massachusetts and the state of New Hampshire, where New Hampshire sued Massachusetts because Massachusetts was trying to tax revenue earned or wages earned by employees that were working physically in New Hampshire. And that's at the Supreme Court right now. So when states sue each other, it goes directly to the Supreme Court. So that's there. The other thing that we're seeing in this world, um, and we've seen it for a long time because remote employees have been a problem for quite some time now, um, is federal intervention. And there's been a few bills proposed at the federal level to try and put some parameters around when nexus should kick in, when withholding should kick in. Um, I would tell you they get proposed almost every year. Historically, they have never passed. But with COVID, now might be the time that we actually get something through the federal legislature to put some sort of standardization across all the states on when these things start to occur. Yeah, so I mean, those are just a lot of complex issues. And, you know, I think what can get even more complicated is that really pre-COVID, a lot of companies have moved into states and they've been evaluating where should we set up our location. And so they may have credits and incentives tied to where their employees are located. And CLA has a credits and incentives practice. We're helping companies pursue these credits and incentives. Those can oftentimes be tied to investing in employees in a state. So how are states looking at remote workforces in terms of credits and incentives? Can you educate us at all on that? Yeah, and you know, it's there's been a lot some guidance coming out. I wouldn't say a lot, but there's been some guidance coming out. And generally what we're seeing is states are are being accommodating with regards to companies um looking less at are you working at this facility as long as the employees are still within the state, you're still going to meet the parameters of the agreement that you had with them. Um we're seeing states increase the funding for training um and incentives around residents, especially around residents because of 
how do you work remote, giving them training on working remote, giving them training if they need to enter a new work field um, as they come back. So states are typically getting good at that. They're coming around on that, but they're focused on residents only. Um, and, and the focus on residents is to keep the investment in the state. In theory, in theory those guys aren't going to move. They're going to stay even after restrictions come off, they're going to stay in the state. And so we're seeing that. The other thing that we're seeing or, or tend to be thinking about is that the residency of the employee or the employee address is going to become very important in these incentive agreements um, and be potentially more significant than the actual um, location of the company when dealing with the agreements and the factors associated with generating credits. Yeah, so what I'm hearing really is bottom line, if you're investing in employees and training, you know, there's going to be some changes probably in how these rules apply, but looking at credits and incentives is a really good practice and a good idea. So Dustin, thank you so much for your insights. We're going to keep you around for questions that are sure. coming through our app. And at this point now, let's pivot over to Jack and Todd and get some PPP updates. So I want to start the conversation with Todd and We've had some information that has come in on the lender side. So the SBA did take some steps to improve the first draw loan program, really to help get funds to businesses faster. Todd, we understand that in reviewing these initial PPP loans, sometimes there were anomalies, data mismatches and eligibility concerns. And those sometimes do require then follow up between the lender and the borrower so that the borrower can access second draw loans. So how have they, has the SBA taken steps to really help facilitate clearing up these processes so that these borrowers can get funds faster? Can you comment on this process? Sure, I can do that, Leslie. Um, I'm going to take my comments in a couple different phases. First, it's there's the communication between the SBA and the lenders themselves and the things that go on there. Next, mm -hmm. there's steps lenders have taken and some of that interaction with the process of forgiveness. Um, then finally, I'm going to touch on a little bit of demand, uh, what we're seeing for demand flow, because we process both loan applications for lenders in this program, as well as forgiveness applications. So let me circle back to the front and say that um, the SBA has set up a good system for, they they know the importance of getting the money in the hands of, of, the, of the recipients, of those that need it on a timely basis. And they've made some good changes to do that. They've changed the flow of the application process. They've made adjustments to that process. So to give you an idea, I think from a from an applicant perspective, they th see all things as coming from the lender when it's a combination of lender and SBA. So the SBA has done things like make changes to the system. They also have like a, a, a national call tomorrow uh, where we get on the line and exchange information and they, and, they, and they try to make the process better and communicate, but also those daily tweaks to the system. So as a, as a, a party that's involved in that application process, we're seeing those changes come through and how they adapt to things to, again, speed that process to the extent possible. But I would also say then on the lender side, you've got some things going on in this process, right? The focus has really been on the review. The challenge, I think, of the, of the focus of the review process has been on the revenue reduction, uh, the documentation, right, and qualification there. And uh, that's where that's more focused on. But I'm also going to say there's some data interplay, some data fields that are important. And the, the interplay between the application process and the forgiveness process is that I will say this. If you've submitted a forgiveness application in the process, then I think some of those data issues have been worked out. Uh, if you haven't, they may get worked out in this application process, because in this application process, what the lender transmits to N SBA, there are more front end controls and checks than there were the first time. And so I think that can hold you up if you're if you're going to deal with data one way or the other. So either you got it cleaned up maybe in your forgiveness application or you're going to get some of those fields like EIN and address and other things cleaned up in this application submission process. Um, and that kind of leads to one other question that I think typically comes up is it's that interplay between first draw forgiveness application and, and, and second draw um, processing of the application, right? So I thought I'd give you a few things. Uh, uh, 
the SBA has given some guidance to lenders for resolution of those processes, and we're aware of those hold processes. But I just thought I'd share with you some general observations of folks that process on both sides or, or help lenders process on both sides. And that is, if, if that first draw forgiveness application has not been submitted yet, um, those are going through. Those applications for second draw seem to be going through just fine without, without, um, without holdup for the most part. And then when you look at those that have submitted first draw applications, uh, those, that's, those results are mixed because one, there may be some things that SBA was aware of or that the reasons that they put it on are things that are in the application itself for subject to review. And obviously the larger ones are, are going to get, um, are going to get addressed uh, the, the 2 million and above, uh, you know, that go through a different review process at SBA are going to have a different process. Um, so that's kind of what's going on right now. But either way, I'm going to tell you those data fields are getting verified and are, are scrutinized. So now uh, let me just shift to demand quickly and give you a sense mm -hmm. of demand. Because many of the lenders try to anticipate, and I'm going to focus on second draws. For those first draw uh, uh, recipients, uh, lenders uh, got a feel for their customer bases and made estimates as to what that flow was going to be uh, overall. But I think they anticipated that that flow or the demand would have been there faster or sooner on the front end. It seems it's been slower and it's going to go over a longer period of time. So I think that's a, unlike this first that first round of funding back in, say, April of last year, I think the funds are going through a little slower. The applications are coming through a little slower than maybe the lenders were anticipating on the front end. And then finally, just let me touch on that forgiveness, uh, simplified forgiveness form, because you've seen in the application side, if you've applied for uh, a second draw or first draw that uh, in some instances uh, lenders might have been adjusting, uh, making policy elections, right, to do things. Mm -hmm. One of the things on the application side for automatic forgiveness is if you're 150 or below and you've got that simplified form, um, that doesn't require documentation, but your lender may have some policy requirements that ask for some documentation in that process. That's going to vary to lender to lender, but I can tell you that their goal is to get those. They're in favor of that, that uh, I'll say, simplified application process for forgiveness because they have that same stake. They want to get that loan forgiven just like the, just like the borrower does. So, uh, th that's what I've had uh, that's been going on uh, up to date and over the last, over the last week, Leslie. Well, dynamite overview, Todd, and I know your group has a webinar that is really specific to this topic tomorrow on loan origination and forgiveness. So I'm sure the financial institutions team is going to do a deep dive tomorrow on that as well. So Jack, let's talk for a moment. Todd talked about the simplified forgiveness form, and I do think it is a hot topic for loans under 150,000. It's welcome news. So give us some updates now that we have the form 3508S. Yeah, thanks uh, for for having me back, Leslie. It's uh, great to be here again. Um, you know, the the one pager is very similar to the old 3508S, uh, only that it is now uh, available to those folks under $150,000. So it's a little expanded because originally it was only for those folks under $50,000. Um, the good thing is if you're in that gap between the 50,000 that could have applied using the 3508S originally and now what you, now the the um the 150 and you had already applied if you haven't gotten forgiveness uh, yet you can pull that original application back if you want to and reapply using the 3508s form the benefit of that is not all of your data is going to go to the SBA and it is very simplified it's a one pager um, we'll go through some of the things on that so um, you know, for those of you that that maybe had jumped the gun and said, okay, I just want to get it out there and and get my forgiveness in there. If it hasn't been processed yet, you do have an avenue to to, to draw that back now. Um, the the 3508S form will be used uh, for both PPP1 and PPP2, so it's already set up. So we don't anticipate any significant changes on that form. So, you know, for those that might recall, the 3508S for borrowers under 50,000 basically did give you that true simplified approach, right? You didn't have to worry about FTE and wage reductions. Um, now, the, while you're under 150, but above 50 can now use this form, they still do have to worry about those wage reductions and or FTE reductions. Now, there's not a place to do all the calculations like there are on the EZ or the regular 3508 form, 
But if you do read the instructions, when it asks about how much forgiveness you're um, requesting, it does carve out that, you know, those folks in that 50 to 150 bucket still do need to, you know, consider those two items. And so people are getting tripped up that they think, oh, I'm, I'm exonerated from that. We're really not. And you do need to, you know, do those calculations. The one thing I will tell you is that it's very important to talk to your banks, right? Because while the form itself doesn't require you to submit a lot of information to support the data we'll go through in a second, um, a lot of the banks are saying, look, if you're gonna use that form, we still wanna make sure you have that data and that we have that data and we're gonna store it for you. Uh, Cause you do have to retain that data for up to four years if it's payroll, three years for non-payroll data. And so the banks may ask for that even though the form says it's not necessarily required. So work with your bank early on that. But I do wanna just go through very quickly the, the items that are included on that PPP forgiveness application, that one pager, right? So you do have to give the employees at the time of loan application and at the time you're applying for forgiveness, right? Those numbers aren't used in your forgiveness calculation, but we do believe that the SBA is just trying to collect data about the number of jobs that were impacted by um, the PPP program itself. Now, you also do have to disclose an approximate amount that was spent on payroll costs. Again, think about the at least 60% uh, needs to be spent on payroll. So you do have to put that information in there. You do have to put in your loan amount and the amount of loan forgiveness you're requesting. And then there are a number of attestations that are out there as well that certifications, if you think about it that way. But the one that, you know, that is out there that you have to really pay attention to is that you're going to be certifying that you've adhered to the terms of the PPP program and that all the information that you've put on the application are true and correct in all material respects. So you definitely want to make sure that you're comfortable with that that you've got the underlying calculations and that you have complied with all the requirements under either the first draw or second draw loan program when you're using that. And again, I can't stress enough, make sure you talk to your bank about the requirements that they're gonna have for the data to submit because you cannot assume that you're not gonna have to put that information into the bank's portal when you submit that application. Yeah, so I mean, I think this is still really good news. Certainly, there's still some requirements that you have to watch out for, but overall, it sounds like it definitely is taking the onus off of those smaller loans, which is fantastic. So I do want to talk about another really hot topic that we've seen, and that is gross receipts. We've had a lot of questions from our professionals and from clients about utilizing the cash method versus the accrual method, particularly as we are trying to apply the 25% reduction in gross receipts test for a quarter compared to a similar quarter in 2019 to see if we're eligible for that second draw loan program. So can you discuss accounting methods and how that might apply as we're doing testing? It's a hot topic right now. You know, I'm getting a, just a ton of questions coming in, um, you know, through our app and, and everything on this topic. And I would love to have a great answer. Um, unfortunately, uh, as is typical for this program, uh, it, the answers are as clear as mud, right? So the, the guidance on this is um, specific in that it says that you use the company's accounting method. And then it actually gives an example of accrual or cash basis. Um, and then further on in the guidance, it makes reference that all the terms that are used to describe this are really, um, you should look to the IRS guidance and tax forms for the definition of those terms. And so, you know, what the guidance fails to refer to, to acknowledge is that many companies have multiple accounting methods, right? You might uh, report your financial statements on an accrual basis, but because it's more advantageous, if you meet certain criteria, you can use a cash method for tax reporting or something in between accrual and ta or cash, which would be your tax basis. And so you can have multiple methods of accounting treatments, right, or accounting methodologies. And so that obviously complicates things because there's no acknowledgement of that in the guidance. 
Now, if you want to take a conservative view, knowing there's a number of references back to tax return line items now on how you size loans and, and some of the other things, one could say, let's use our tax method, right? Mm -hmm. However, that is not necessarily the only answer that's out there. And, and again, I will defer a lot of cases to banks, right? Because the banks are going to be, again, the gatekeeper in this situation. And so they're going to have some policies on this. And some banks are taking a very you know um, narrow view and they're saying, we want tax return data to be able to back this up. You know, whether it's sales and use tax reports on quarterly numbers or, you know, um, at, for annual numbers, it has to be on your tax return. So they are using the tax numbers, uh, obviously, for those things. However, if you look at some of the guidance on the information that can be submitted, internal financial statements are clearly one of the allowable methodologies to support that 25% decrease. It even goes so far as to say how the, the, the borrower needs to submit that data, that the first page has to be signed as an acknowledgement that all the information is complete and accurate and all other pages need to be initialed. So if there wasn't an expectation that internal financials, which might be a cruel basis, could be used, why would they have gone through all that uh, you know problem to disclose how to submit that information? So. You know, this would be one of these areas that I would hope we get more guidance on from an FAQ perspective over the coming weeks. Um, the SBA knows that there's a lot of kind of unanswered questions now, but this has to be at the top of that list. Yeah, so speaking of things at the top of the list of questions and gross receipts, let's also talk about these affiliate rules. Uh -huh. And, you know, it, it previously was, I think, more of a concern with just employee count. We've got two areas where it's a concern now. So it's not only employee count, but we've got to think about it with affiliates and gross receipts now too. So talk about any insights you can with respect to the second draw in this topic. Yeah, so the, you know, the, again, the rules on this one are fairly clear, right? And they do say that when you look at your 25% decrease test, it needs to be done using gross receipts of the borrower and its affiliates. Now, affiliates, you know, and, and how you define affiliates and whether it's just based on control or management or other agreement, you know, the affiliate roles are well beyond a discussion on the live stream, unfortunately. Um, but you do have to look at it on that aggregate group basis. But this could create some, you know, unusual situations. Now, for instance, you as a borrower may have experienced, you know, in your own financial results, that 25% decrease. However, if you've got some affiliates that just had great years and in the quarters that you experienced your dips, they still performed well, you might as a collective group not have a 25% decrease in any quarter. And so even though you as a borrower experienced that decrease, you would not meet the test at that affiliate group level. Therefore, you wouldn't be able to apply for a PPP2 loan, right? Now, flip that on its ear. You are the company that did perform well. You never had a 25% decrease. However, you have an affiliate that really had one or two really bad quarters. And collectively, when you add your stuff together, you are below 25%. Now you could have a borrower that individually didn't experience that 25% decrease that actually does qualify to apply for the PPP2 loan, right? So looking at these affiliate rules are very important. This is another area though that we would expect guidance to come out. Right now, it looks like it's just a single tier test at the affiliate group level. One could expect maybe you'd have to pass both tiers, right? At the individual level and the affiliate level, but we don't know at this point and there's, you know, that'll be what uh, we hope the SBA gives us some thoughts on. Yeah, this is one though I definitely think where if you think you have an affiliate question, you definitely need to work with us and have us help you navigate it. Don't go that one alone. Definitely. I do want to pivot for one second away from PPP. We are going to take a few questions from our viewers, but it is not a normal live stream if we do not have some breaking news. And we have some exciting news in the world of opportunity zones, a potential amended return opportunity. And I'm really excited about this. So the IRS released some guidance 
Carrie Heyman and our real estate group did a blog post about this, which you can go read. But Jack, why don't you tell us what is going on in the world of Opportunity Zones? Yeah, so, you know, for those of you who are familiar with Opportunity Zones, some great benefits to investors that had significant capital gains. You you can get a, a deferral of paying the tax on those capital gains, even a reduction in the ultimate tax you pay, and then no tax on the appreciation and the value of the investment, right? So just a tremendous program and one that a number of investors that have capital gains are taking advantage of. Now, there are a lot of rules around those programs, though, and one of those rules is generally you have to deploy that capital within 180 days. Now, there's a few different 180 day periods that you get to choose from, but it's it's within 180 days. Now, last year, obviously, there were not a lot of QOF funds that got set up early in the year. They weren't able to deploy capital. And as a result of that, the IRS came out uh, last year and said that if you had a gain and the, that 180 day window was going to expire after April 1st last year, um, that we will extend that window of time through December 31st. So that meant you had all the way to the end of last year. The guidance we got uh, earlier this week was that you that deadline extended is going to get re-extended now and now takes you out through March 31st, 2021. Where the you know what this creates is a unique opportunity. You might be an inv- uh, an individual who had a capital gain transaction in 2019. You may have already paid tax on that transaction on your 2019 return. But if now you take the gain and invest it in an opportunity zone fund, you can go back, amend that return for 2019 and get those funds back that you paid. And as long as you're there in there by uh, March 31st, that's a valid election. You would have to do an amended return, as you mentioned. Now, there were also some flexibilities put in there related to the operators of qualified opportunity zone funds, too. There's a lot of testing that happens on a biannual basis. We did get some relief for the operators as well in that notice from the IRS. So um, just a lot of good things happening in the OZ space uh, that that make it still a very attractive program uh, and trying to be as flexible as possible to incentivize those investments. Well, who doesn't love some post-mortem tax planning? I know I sure do. So I I think it's very exciting. We are going to take a couple questions from our viewers. The first one that I want to take is a PPP multi-state question. So brace yourself, Dustin. I hope you're ready for this one. This is related to if we file in multiple states, but most of our business is in Indiana, do we need to file in each state differently in relation to our PPP loan? Man, that's a zinger. Well, uh, yeah, I I mean, the short answer is yes. Uh, I mean, that's the simple answer as well. Um, I mean, and and as with most things from a state tax standpoint, it's going to depend. It's going to depend on the states that you're filing in and when you file that return um, and what states from a legislative standpoint, have done by the time you do file your return. So, you know, the question is, when should I file that return? Um, And should I give states a little bit more time to decipher the bill and make the changes that are necessary to their law so that I don't have to go back and amend later on? And you know what I've been telling people, Dustin? It's really catchy. It goes, extend is your friend this year. <laughs> I, I cannot disagree with that at this point. Um, I mean, if if you're trying to get the most accurate tax return and take advantage of those benefits on a state-by-state basis, that's probably not, not bad advice. All right. Well, let's also take a PPP question. So, this is from Ben, and he said he's under the understanding that headcount was not a determining factor as it relates to PPP reimbursement under the new guidelines, yet the new 3508S still has a question relating to previous and current headcount. So really, can we comment on that? And is the SBA looking for this for full reimbursement? So Jack, I don't know if you want to comment on that one. Sure. Yeah, um, again, the the information on the form itself, employee count at application and employee count at timing of forgiveness application, 
those two numbers don't come into play in any of the calculations. You're correct there. Those are more information gathering um, for the SBA itself, right? Now, with that being said, though, um, as I mentioned earlier, the the 3508 um, does kind of exonerate those folks under 50,000 from any FTE testing. However, if you're in that bucket between 50,000 and 150, FTE testing is still relevant. You don't have to provide all the data on, you know, to support that, and the calculations aren't laid out on the form, but you still have to do those. So, so headcount is still a factor for those folks kind of 50,000 to, to 150, unless you meet some of those safe harbors that says we didn't reduce heads or you couldn't operate your business at pre-COVID levels um, because of government orders, in which case then there is no FTE testing that needs to occur. So again, just reasons that uh, it does help to consult with uh, you know folks that are involved in, in this on a regular basis to help make sure you get the right form and you're doing the right calculations and don't submit something that could trip you up later if the SBA happens to review things. Great. Well, thanks for clarifying that. And now, Todd, we have a question too. So what if you have, what do you do if your bank has not gotten their loan forgiveness process going yet? Well, Leslie, the first thing I'd say is have them call me because we can help them. But <laughs> <laughs> But the but but honestly, it, it there are some out there that haven't started the process and and that or haven't organized how they're going to accept in process. And I can I know that's frustrating from a borrower standpoint. Um, but and and honestly, you know that, that I would say that's probably rare and hopefully rare, right? Um, uh, but uh, you know, it is a, it is a is it is it is a process to try to do that and and uh, application processing at this, at this point is difficult uh, for some institutions. I would say, unfortunately, you're at the mercy of your of your institution on that. They're the one that needs to accept that and process that forgiveness application. So you have to wait until they're ready to accept it. But I would hope that that would be soon if it hasn't started yet. Um, and I would the other thing I would add to to Jack's response on the 3508s is that's one of those fields of uh, that that the lender is not required to verify all fields. So the just like Jack said, consistent with that, uh, uh, some of those uh, questions in those fields they don't impact the lender decision nor the SBA decision. So. Awesome. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have today. I do want to thank our speakers. I want to thank our moderators who have been live with us, helping to answer all of your questions. And I absolutely want to thank our viewers for all of your engagement and questions. Please register, continue to engage with us. We love having you be part of the conversation with us. We will see you next week. And until then, stay safe and healthy. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much.